Perfect. So thank you so much, Cloda, and um, welcome to everyone. We're, we're really delighted to be able to be here today with you as part of um, the Palo Care Week. Um, and to begin with, I'd, I'd just like to extend our thanks to the All Ireland Institute of Hospice and Palo Care for hosting us during this week. Um, it's always a really packed week full of, um, full of great events, um, which we're all joining. Um, so we do, we do really appreciate it. And over the next hour, we're really hoping to tell you a bit about music therapy and bereavement. So it'll start with a, a description really of what music therapy is. Um, then we'll talk a bit about why we feel music therapy has potential um, in terms of um, being part of the offering of, of bereavement sport interventions. And we'll talk to you a bit as well about a current research project we have, the Musicare project, which aims to build the research evidence base for the use of music therapy in bereavement. Okay. So my colleagues and I, we were delighted actually whenever we saw the theme for Palliative Care Week this year, Palliative Care, it's more than you think. Um, as this resonates very nicely um, with, with the work that, that we do. Firstly, the, the focus on carers, um, and carers at both pre and, and post bereavement. I think the vast majority of people in this call, I'm sure, recognise that providing support to carers um, is, a, is a core component of palliative end of life care. But we also know that it was only quite recently that the World Health Organisation updated their definition of palliative care to, to, to include carers. It's around improving quality of life for individuals with life-limiting illnesses and their close persons. We also, for those of us that are familiar with palliative and end-of-life care, recognise that psychosocial support is also a very important component of the discipline, which is a, a very holistic discipline. But again, the public perception of palliative care perhaps goes more towards the management of um, symptoms, often physical symptoms such as pain. And then lastly, we have this focus on arts-based approaches and on music therapy, which actually have a very long tradition within palliative and of life care from the very conception of the hospice movement. Um, you know, in, in those early days, there is um, you know, evidence of, um, of the role of, of music therapy, but um, we also recognize that um, in terms of public awareness, um, we're, we're, not, we're not quite there yet. So what we hope to do over the next hour is give you an understanding of what music therapy is, um, of how music therapy has potential as bereavement support intervention, and one of my colleagues is then going to give you an example of music therapy in, in, in practice using several case examples. We're going to talk about the Music Care project, um, and then we're going to have some time for questions and discussion, and we'll, we'll look forward to, um, to hearing your comments. and. Um, perhaps some of your experience as well if, um, if you work in, in this field. So to introduce you to, um, to the team, um, you've had an introduction already to myself and, and Tracy. Um, again, today you'll hear from Dr. Katie Gillespie, um, who's a research fellow on the Music Care Project um, at Queen's University Belfast. We have Daniel Thomas, who is a music therapy clinician and director at Chroma, which is the largest uh, music therapy organisation in the UK. We have Noah Potvin, um, who is a music therapy clinician um, and an assistant professor at um, Duskeen University in the States. And we have Jenny Kirkwood, who is a music therapy clinician, um, who is currently working at the, the PHA. We also have um, members of the team who um, are here today, um, not necessarily presenting, but will be part of the discussion, such as Dr. Angela McCullough and Lorna Roche, who are um, part of our care advisory group, um, Dr. Audrey Rolston, who is a senior lecturer in social work at Queen's University of Belfast, and Ishan and Cara, who are two students here supporting um, the project. So I'll start by handing over to my colleague Daniel um, to, to lead this session on what is music therapy. And Daniel, I'll, I'll move the slides on for you if you just tell me when you're ready. Okay, thank you very much, Lisa. Hello, everybody. Uh, lovely to, to be here with you. Um, so yes, if you... Oops. Let's... Well, geez, that just went. Yeah, let's have a look. Okay. Now we're back. Brilliant. So yeah, let's... Uh move to the first slide please. Lovely, so um, 
my name is Daniel Thomas. I've, I've been a music therapist for about 20 years um, and currently managing director of, of Chroma. Um, Lisa was, was kind enough to, to sort of introduce Chroma as one of the largest providers of actually music, art and drama therapy in, in the UK. Um, I'm just going to give you uh, a, a sort of a big overview of, of the profession. Um, and, and then let colleagues sort of um, focus in on, um, you know, the, the sort of specific areas around, around palliative care. First of all, to say it is a worldwide profession. Um, we have areas of expertise, uh, you know, in, in many of the continents and many, many countries um, around the world. Um, and, it, and therefore, you know, the, the sort of um, the research and the, and the practice that we can tap into globally is, is really gathering pace around music therapy. And it's, it's been considerably on the uptick in the last sort of 15, um, 15 or so years globally. Um, thinking about uh, music therapy in, in the UK, um, it is part of the uh, AHP. So it's an allied health profession within, within the NHS. And again, specifically in the UK, um, regulated by the Health and Care Professions Council. We um, are a very collaborative profession. Um, we've got a professional association here, um, the BAMT in Ireland. Um, I think you've got the Irish Association of Creative Arts Therapists, um, which is the art, drama and music therapists together. Um, within Ireland, my understanding is that it, it is not a protected um, title in law as it is in the UK, but it's, you've got some amazing training courses in Ireland, I think there's one uh, a really well-established one in Limerick. And so um, there are, you know, clinicians and professionals uh, across Ireland and the rest of the UK and Northern Ireland working, um, you know, uh, around uh, very various different client groups and populations. Um, in the UK, again, it's master's level. Um, and I think there are about 1,200, um, you know, music therapists um, in the UK. I was just trying to look at the, uh, the numbers for Ireland. Jenny, you might know, um, but I think it's going to be around 300, maybe 250 in, in Ireland. If I can go to the next slide, please, Lisa. Um, if any of you have seen, the, there's an amazing YouTube video called um, The Brain on Music. You can search for that. And it's basically, it's, it's a, a patient in an fMRI scanner listening to a piece of music. And we can see um, that person's brain, how, how that person's brain is stimulated by music. And what you, what you see in that, in that clip is that um, a huge diverse areas of the brain stimulated by music. Um, and the list there uh, just sort of starts to highlight how music um, can be used as a treatment modality across sensory motor, so that's movement, speech and language, cognition. So thinking about, you know, really basic things like the recipe, I'm drinking a weird looking cup of tea, but that's a recipe. I've had to remember how to do that. And sometimes we can use melody um, to, to help people hang on to uh, recipes for simple everyday things like cups of tea or a, how to make a you know slice of toast. So lots of those cognitive, core cognitive, cognitive executive functions. Psychological, so our feelings and our emotions. You know, all of us at some point today would have probably heard a piece of music um, and had an emotional reaction to it. And again, when we're when we're thinking about working collaboratively with um, the client or the patient and their family and members of the, the team who are supporting them. It's very much a collaboration thinking about how, um, you know, music can be used for, for you know, clinical and social aims. Um, we do a lot of work uh, at Chroma um, around family-based family, family -based issues, so adoption, abuse and neglect. And again, you know, in, in, in this country, in Ireland, around the world, there is significant um, you know, best practice being being developed around all of these areas, and obviously, um, bereavement um, bereavement support, palliative care is is one of those um, areas that has had lots and lots of, of amazing you know research and input over the years. If I can move on with the slide, please. Um, again, just trying to, to give you a sense of the breadth of music therapy. I've just list, listed uh, whatever that is, eight or nine. Um, you know, clinical areas, cohorts. Um, I think within, within Chroma, the youngest uh, client that we've ever had was a six month old baby um, where we, we were working with her in a hospital setting um, using uh, very slow music to help regulate her breathing and her, her heart function. 
um, so that nurses could come in and do a um, sort of cleaning procedure on her tracheotomy. And it was just the simplest and most sort of peaceful way of keeping her very, very steady and, and, and relaxed so that the nurse could do their, um, their essential medical work. But you can see there we're looking at obviously bereavement, attachment, so parent-child attachments, um, lots of work around mental health at all sort of at all spectrums of, of mental health, um, I would say. Brain injury, again, from, from people who have a, quote, mild brain injury to those who are not in a coma, um, but in, in what's called a prolonged disorder of consciousness. Again, research really showing up that um, autobiographically relevant music, so music that they've had before their injury, can really start to um, connect with them, even though externally they're very unable to to give us many signs that, that they are um, aware of what's going on around them. Um, clearly palliative care, um, and one of my colleagues is, is going to present more about that through case studies. And you will have hopefully have seen, um, I think it was last year, the, uh, the big push around dementia, the sort of the 2020 um, dementia plan, trying to get um, music specifically, and then music therapy as a distinct area of clinical practice. Um, uh, provided for as many people um, at that sort of stage of, of, of the, the end of their life and obviously early, early onset dementia as well. Again, because the, the research has been so clear that musical memories remain you know, intact. Um, my grandma was 100 on the weekend and um, we had a, a big party and a postcard from the Queen and all that sort of stuff. It, it was lovely. Um, but the thing that was on in the background was music from when she was about... Uh, in her sort of 30s and 40s with her husband. And, and that seemed to really help her connect to the people that, that were there in the room. So um, just one more slide, please. Thank you. Um, just as a, you know, uh, Lisa mentioned in her introduction that music therapy has been used um, within palliative care um, for, you know, more than 30 years. Um, in Canada, um, you know, since the late 70s, um, therapists, music therapists, again, making important contributions to the care of seriously ill patients. Lots of collaboration, thinking about how we can support those who are left behind. Um, and, and that's part of, you know, the work that the, the team um, have been thinking about and has, has sort of helped shape uh, the ideas around music carer. Um, and then there is lots of, of different types of, of research around music therapy and palliative care. I've just highlighted this one specific one, um, effective treatment with a low dropout rate. Um, again, what, what we want is, is people to feel able to, uh, to, to take part and, and feel that it's beneficial from their point of view, from their perspective. Um, that can be a range of working with improvisation um, and, and sort of creating music in the moment. Uh, and that's very, very helpful when, when words you know, aren't really quite enough to describe someone's experience. Often we find that music is a great vehicle for, for speaking when words sort of fail. But we can also use um, much more structured ways of working like songwriting, um, that, that sense of trying to capture someone's thoughts and feelings looking backwards, maybe looking in the moment about how they're doing, and also projecting forward. What would they like to say to loved ones who, um, you know, they can't, uh, you know, once they're, they've passed away, they're not going to be able to give these messages. So songs are very, very strong, important containers that, that music therapists can use. And I think I'll just go to my final slide, Lisa, please. Um, again, in, in the United Kingdom and in Ireland, there are a number of um, really significant, well-established uh, music therapy providers. Um, there's obviously ourselves, Chroma, um, Nordoff Robbins, Chilton Music Therapy. Um, in the UK, there's the NHS. And there are uh, really, really high quality self-employed music therapists everywhere and I'm sort of globally. Um, that is very much the case. Um, and just, uh, you know, we've, we've been involved in, in various projects around um, palliative care. So just to sort of flag up for ourselves at Chroma, we have about 103 art, drama, and music therapists at the moment um, with over 50 music therapists. Um, we've been around for about eight years and, um, you know, do, do an awful lot of work across the, the various cohorts and, and clinical groups. Um, and it's hopefully, you know, it's been a, a good... 10 minutes or so uh, you listening to this just to give you a sense of what music therapy is as a profession 
um, and then to to hand over to colleagues who are going to say just focus down a little bit more on our on our important subject area today. So thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. So as Daniel has very eloquently um, taken us through, music therapy um, is, is across a range of different settings, a range of different clinical populations, one of which is palliative mental life care. And so now we're going to delve into a little bit more detail in terms of music therapy in bereavement. And to start things off, um, in, in terms of, of really trying to evidence the fit of music therapy into bereavement support, I'm just going to give a bit of a brief overview in terms of where bereavement support um, as a discipline is, um, is moving towards. So we all recognize that bereavement is one of the most common yet universally distressing lifetime experiences. Each one of us will experience the bereavement within our lifetimes and indeed we're still in the midst of, of what is a mass bereavement event with individuals perhaps um, experiencing bereavement of the close person for the very first time. Um, and through bereavement, there are a range of, of different individualized responses. The vast majority of individuals will psychologically adjust um, over time. But a smaller group of individuals, thought to be between 8 and, and 30% of those um, who experience bereavement, will go on to experience complicated grief. Complicated grief is a prolonged grief disorder associated with significant psychological and social impairment um, in the longer term. So an example of this would be um, clinical depression. And when we're thinking about bereavement support, um, this is really one of the end goals um, in terms of supporting the normal grieving process and, and trying to avoid um, that this longer term impact um, in relation to complicated grief. Um, so we need to consider bereavement support across a continuum, both pre-bereavement, during bereavement, and, and also after a, a close person dies. And this is reflected in clinical guidelines and policy documents, as well as in the research, um, that we need a public health approach to bereavement support. So around early um, psychosocial intervention and continuity of care, supporting the normal grieving process, and now there is um, a, a focus really on a resilience-based approach to bereavement support. So this, this includes providing social support um, through support services. We're moving away um, from pathologizing grief, from this, this need to um, extinguish bereavement, but instead recognizing this as being an important um, experience and experience that we need to support individuals um, through in terms of finding meaning from, from loss. Um, there was an important piece of work done recently um, by the Marie Curie Centre in, in Cardiff where they identified what the core outcomes should be whenever we're evaluating bereavement support intervention. So why we measure what a successful bereavement support intervention is. And by consensus, the two outcomes that they came up with um, was an individual's ability to cope with grief, um, as well as quality of life and, and emotional well-being. So again, evidencing that you know, we are very much moving towards resilience-based approaches. And when we look at the current evidence base in terms of bereavement support, unfortunately, this is very much an underdeveloped um, evidence base. Bereavement it, as an area is recognized as, as being very important um, as evidenced in a Marie Curie priority setting partnership exercise a few years ago, um, where many of the unanswered priority research questions identified by individuals with life-limiting illnesses, their close persons and clinicians, were around bereavement. Unfortunately, alongside that, there has been very little um, funding, research funding within the UK over the past number of years that has been focused on bereavement. Um, and that has contributed um, towards this, this underdeveloped research base. Um, this is a systematic review where um, they recommended that we need more evidence and we need better quality evidence. And um, just to make clear at this point that this is really just the research evidence that, um, that we're discussing here. Of course, we all understand that um, you know, there, there are a range of, of excellent interventions and services that are happening out there in practice that perhaps haven't been formally evaluated. But certainly in terms of the research evidence base, um, this is an area that, that needs more attention. And there's a lot of scope and opportunity there to develop innovative um, models of, of, of bereavement support. 
When we do look at the research evidence base and we look at different interventions that have been evaluated, actually very few of them map on to the risk and protective factors for complicated grief. Um, so risk factors are clearly factors that increase an individual's likelihood to experience complicated grief. Protective factors are um, factors that help protect against, against this risk. I put out some examples here. This is by no means comprehensive. Um, it, it's just some examples of risk and protective factors that are quite well cited in the literature. So risk factors, we have the likes of pre-bereavement depression, pre-bereavement anxiety, family conflict at end of life, her perceived social support, her non-acceptance of loss, and difficulty accessing positive memories. And then in terms of protective factors, we have higher spirituality, satisfaction with palliative care, and perceived preparedness for death. And we believe that these are factors that can be influenced and modified or, or changed through arts-based therapeutic approaches. And we feel that music therapy um, in particular, um, has, has a, 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 a unique um, contribution um, that it can make to, um, to, to modifying these factors and subsequently helping to protect individuals from um, the, these quite significant longer term effects of, of complicated grief. We understand that music is, is universal, so um, Daniel has already discussed this, that music plays an important role in, in each, of our, each of our lives. It also has an important role to play in emotionally challenging circumstances. So um, an example of this during the pandemic was um, during some of the first lockdowns in Italy, with individuals going out onto their balconies and playing music for their, their neighbours and their communities. We also see it in terms of uh, popular music. So I've tried to get some examples here across genres, across decades of songs that have been composed by artists in order to help them to really process um, their, their, their grief and, and loss and provide connection um, to, that, to that person um, in, in their lives. Um, for us, um, if, if we aren't musicians, um, many of us will have a particular piece of music or, or indeed lyrics within a certain song as well that, um, that remind us um, of, of particular individuals or particular um, parts and um, points in our, in, our, in our life. And with music therapy, we're going a little bit beyond that because we're using music as a tool within a therapeutic approach. And this is really how I understand it as a, um, the first time I came across music therapy um, as a psychologist, not as a music therapist. Um, and one of my colleagues described it as, as really a tool, a way to facilitate the therapeutic process. Um, we've undertaken some research several years ago. This was at Marie Curie Hospice in Belfast. Um, and this is with individuals at end of life. My carers were welcome to be part of this process, but the intervention was targeted towards um, the individuals at end of life themselves. And what we find from that was that the music therapy helped individuals to safely express emotions. So what we were told was that um, individuals felt that actually during the music therapy sessions, they were better able to communicate difficult emotions and um, you know, things that they, they find challenging to convey in normal conversation with, with their loved ones. They told us that the music therapy helped to reconnect them with happier memories and it helped to transcend them to a higher place. So spirituality was very much part of this as well for some individuals. And it helped them to strengthen social bonds with loved ones and provide ongoing connections after death. So if you, if you look at some of these mechanisms really that we identified in terms of our work with individuals at, at end of life and um, think back to those risk and protective factors, um, hopefully you can see that there is a level of alignment there and this is why we think that music therapy potentially could have um, a, a significant impact um, in terms of um, individuals um, supporting um, those at, at, at end of life. But there is uncertainty around whether music therapy with informal care is pre and post bereavement is effective. There's uncertainty around how it can influence outcomes and how it's experienced. And this is part of the rationale for the, the research project that, that we're um, undertaking at, at present. It's an open question as to whether 
Um, there are um, significant impacts on, on outcomes for, um, for individuals who are bereaved and, and how um, those, those uh, improvements are, are realised. Now, the, the consequence of an underdeveloped research base is that music therapy isn't referenced in end-of-life care clinical guidelines, um, and it's actually rarely funded as a core service in the NHS. One of my colleagues will share with you some of the findings from survey that we carried out a, a few years ago. So at present, there is inequitable access to individuals, um, whether they're patients or whether they're carers in palliative end-of-life care um, settings who may want to access music therapy. But I'm going to hand over now to my colleague Noah, who is going to give um, some, some case examples, really, of the work that he has done as a music therapist in, in providing support um, during the pre-bereavement period. Thank you, Noah. Hi, all. Um, it's good to be here. Um, as uh, Lisa said at the beginning, um, you can see my name is Noah. I have worked in end-of-life care for a long time, and I'm currently an assistant professor at Duquesne, and that's uh, end-of-life care is currently the bulk of my scholarship and research. I'm so happy to talk to you about this uh, particular gate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about pre-bereavement and its importance to the large bereavement process and speak a little bit more to music therapy and then use a, a, a case vignette, really, to um, illustrate some of these ideas and concepts that were thrown around. Slide. Thank you. So when I started working, so something that, that, that got me interested in pre-bereavement was when I was working in my doctorate and as my, I was a research GA and my research mentor had me part of a project in which outpatient cancer patients were provided music therapy and music listening. So music listening is not music therapy in that there's no assessment and treatment processing and evaluation um, that happens as part of a rigorous and systematic process of treatments. It's music listening is just, I just need to see you, let's listen to some music together. So there was that, so there was those two different um, conditions in play. And what they were looking to see was if we compare music therapy to music listening, can we find any significant differences in depression, anxiety, and several other uh, markers? And they didn't find anything uh, significant in difference between the two, which was a surprise, but it was a mixed method study. So my role was to, uh, uh, do the interviews and to analyze the data. And so what we found was that um, it actually would not have necessarily been appropriate for, let's take anxiety for instance, for anxiety to have gone down at this point in their care. So for I always think back to this one person, uh, he was in his 50s and he was diagnosed with a, a very advanced stage, um, very aggressive type of cancer. And he was told your prognosis is six months or less. And so he had done the work to uh, say goodbye to his, to his wife, to his daughter, uh, leave his job, say goodbye to friends, the whole deal. And then he became cancer free and he needed to reintegrate back into a life that he had already said goodbye to. And what we realized looking, you know, pouring over this data and taking a look at the findings was that it would have been unethical for us to have reduced his anxiety. His anxiety was actually something that he needed to be engaging with on a larger existential level. And so if we're just focusing on what's directly in front of us in terms of wanting, in terms of like a, a superficial approach to symptom management, we're actually missing what music therapy is able to provide in terms of um, being a medium through which people can engage with these really challenging life transitions and, and life circumstances in a, in a meaningful way. So I was thinking about that with pre-bereavements, you know, what's the function of music therapy um, as, as a caregiver's loved one is, is dying. Are we, are we actually looking for them to feel less sad about that? Or should we actually be helping them to engage with the sadness, engage with the loss in a much more active way, using music as a condition that would make it, um, make it uh, an experience that would not only be safer in terms of being able to feel it explicitly, but also more productive to the extent that they can move through the emotions, move through the memories and come out the other side with a greater sense of insight in terms of what this process could provide them once their loved one did inevitably die. So uh, taking, uh, looking into the pre-bereavement literature, we see that it's a process of emotional, psychological, interpersonal and spiritual preparation that caregivers undergo it's a really, it's a unique process to the extent that it's not, um, it's not hypothetical. It's something that's, that's actually happening to them right now. And they know that 
inevitably that pre-bereavement period is going to end and it's going to transition into bereavement once their loved one passes, but they don't really quite know when. Um, uh, in terms of uh, specifically uh, a specific death event. So it's a distinct preparatory stage for bereavement. Um, something, uh, when I was doing my dissertation looking at pre-bereavement, I actively moved away from terms like pre-loss or anticipatory grief. Pre-loss suggests that there's no loss prior to death. But if you, um, but if you work with caregivers of people with dementia and they've been that caregiver for three, five, 10 years, they'll talk to you about these, this continuous feeling of loss that happens. Um, sometimes they're smaller losses and sometimes they're more major ones. Um, but it's something that's, that's continually to, to happen throughout. And what's really tricky with pre-bereavement is we don't really have a commonly defined starting point because we don't really typically talk about caregivers in this way. Oftentimes when we speak to end of life care, we're thinking about it from the patient perspective and caregivers are, are treated more as a secondary, um, uh, secondary consideration. But, and this is purely anecdotal, so you know, take that for what, for what you, uh, take that with a grain of salt. But it's been my experience working in end of life care you know, for the, over the past decade is that it's traditionally the caregivers who require the greatest amount of support at the end of life, that there is a sense of resolution that often happens for somebody who has reached a certain point in their disease process or even just their larger life process in which they may not necessarily be happy about dying, but they reach a place of acceptance with it. And it's the loved ones around them that are, that are often struggling. And yet um, caregivers are ones that who uh, have traditionally not gotten as much attention as they would uh, benefit from receiving. Because they are, at, they are at increased risk of physical, mental, and emotional challenges. There's plenty of literature out there that talks about the, um, that talks about the, the, not just the health challenges that occur during pre-bereavement, but the health challenges that occur after or through bereavement as well. And there's a projected increase of uh, informal caregiver. Informal are those who provide caregiving services but are not paid. So like we would be considered formal caregivers, for instance. And there's a projected increase of informal caregivers with 70% uh, of them being home-based. Um, so my perspective on this is through the states. Obviously, we have a very different healthcare system here. Um, we have nursing homes and various long-term care facilities, which are um, incredibly expensive and are increasingly priced out of the middle class. And so as the baby boomer generation continues to age and they live longer, the expectation is that there is going to, uh, they will have to be with, living with not just family, but this, but neighbors and, and um, or not just immediate family, but neighbors and extended family as well, because those will be the, um, it's going to be their only option in terms of that sort of day-to-day -day support. Next slide, please. So what are we looking at when we're, working in pre-bereavement. Um, my dissertation was interviewing caregivers who had gone through pre-bereavement with a music therapist and they had sat in and not sat in, but been a part of joint music therapy sessions with their loved one prior to the loved one passing away. And the most significant finding that came from that grounded theory, um, the grounded theory study was that within music therapy, caregivers were able to re-engage with their pre-illness identity and that um, so that could have been parent or spouse or child, given the, um, the, the sample that I had for this particular study. Meaning that at that point at which they were receiving music therapy, they were not providing acts of love so much as acts of service. An act of service was I'm feeding my husband dinner, whereas an act of love is I'm eating dinner with my husband. And that was in part because they, need, they had reached a place where their role in their loved one's life was to be very utilitarian. They needed to attend to all these uh, uh, ADLs or activities of daily living that their loved one was unable to independently uh, complete on their own. And so they moved further and further away from these pre-illness identities of parent, child, or spouse and closer and closer to caregiver. And within music therapy, they found a balance between the two. They were never going to fully leave the caregiver role while their loved one was alive, but they're able to be able to uh, be in a share in space with their loved one in which they're able to reconnect as spouses, as partners, as um, or through the parent-child dynamic. And by doing that, they're able to mitigate the risk of caregiver burnout or over time care, uh, uh, heightened risk of care, uh, uh, complicated grief because they were able to look at their caregiving process and see that there was meaning and value that was infused into it, that there was, despite the hardship, that there was something that they could extract from that process that was going to uh, be of a, that, that could be seen as a resource for them. 
Um, it cultivates relationships with in internal and external resources. So those internal and external resources are uh, things that help to mitigate the risk of that burnout. Um, it, it helps pre-bereavement processes of resolution and closure be a foundation for healthy bereavement. So uh, bereavement that starts right when their loved one passes away is often a bereaved process that is potentially going to be more complicated or more incomplete. And ideally, we are helping that individual to prepare for that, uh, prepare for that death event. Uh, next slide, please. So we're uh, a bit... So more uh, specific to this case unit that we're gonna be taking a quick look at, uh, relationship closure plays a really important role. Uh, death doesn't stop the way that caregivers and care recipients relate to one another, it just transforms it. It means that there's a different way of, of engaging with, and there's plenty of research out there that talks about how uh, loved ones will, um, the, the various things that loved ones will do after somebody passes away. So for instance, around holidays, they, um, so like in my family, when my grandmother passed away, she always cooked the ham on Christmas dinner. And so my brother assumed that role. It was a way of, of, of keeping what my grandmother introduced to the family alive. And it was a way of sort of passing that legacy down. Um, and that's just one example. So caregivers develop new ways of remaining connected and related to care recipients, and it leaves room for new relationships, relationships to develop with their loved one. Next slide. Um, so these are just various interventions that a music therapist might employ. Um, they might use some, something like a song dedication, where a loved one might think of a song that they want to offer to uh, a caregiver, um, or the caregiver offers to the loved one. Um, we'll use song cycles, which there might be like themes that are interwoven throughout each of these songs, and they they tell narratives, they tell stories. And what's really important to emphasize here is that within music therapy, we're not um, music therapists are not in the we're not on the hunt for non-musical goals, just like physical therapists are not looking to achieve non-physical goals, and nursing and nurses aren't looking to achieve non-nursing goals. We're explicitly looking to achieve musical goals with the idea being that to engage musically, to be creative in life is something that's intrinsically healthy all into itself. So with the song cycle, what we're trying to do is tell stories through the music. And we might talk about it afterwards because it might help them to organize their experience, but the transformation, the change occurs within that musical encounter. And then there might be life review projects. Um, and so that'll play into this case vignette. If we uh, turn, uh, next slide, please. So uh, Frank was, so this is an example of what I was talking about before with uh, the, the person who's receiving hospice services actually being in a place of, of acceptance and being, you know, relatively moving forward relatively in a, in a healthy way towards death and the caregivers around, around having more of a challenge. So Frank was somebody who was diagnosed with ALS two years prior to coming on to hospice services. Um, so ALS is one of the very few disease trajectories that we have a pretty clear understanding or, or projection as to what is going to happen and when it's going to happen. It's just, uh, unfortunately, a very insidious condition and um, it's a pretty unrelenting, unrelenting march um, towards, uh, towards decompensation. So upon assessment, uh, Frank presented as in preparation stage of writing for uh, this change or, or for death. He was engaging in a lot of work, um, personal self-work, one of them being he was compiling pictures in the scrapbooks, writing brief narratives about each collection. And at this point, Frank was uh, very limited in what he was able to do, but they, he had a keyboard that was connected, or he had an iPad that was uh, casting onto his TV. And he, through, the, uh, through the iPad, he was able to do quite a bit. Actually, it was a, a real gift that he had technology at his disposal. And so one of the things he was able to do was access pictures that had previously been uploaded onto the cloud and start to arrange them through some software. And he was able to manipulate one digit to type out. Um, so he would be telling stories. He'd be writing out like a paragraph per collection of, of pictures. So Jack was 15 and his entire um, time in high school was defined by his dad, who at one point had been this very vibrant person. He had been the soccer coach. He had been the guy taking him to the amusement park. He was very active and full of life. Um, and so seeing his dad in this, um, in this very different state was, uh, was challenging in a number of different ways. But upon assessment, what I was noticing was that Jack was removing himself from being his son. And that Frank, in turn, was not was not his dad. Frank was just like this guy in his house who was slowly um, was slowly declining in health. And so, you know, he would see his dad and he'd be compassionate and engaging, and they would just like swap stories, but they weren't connecting his father son 
at least on Jack's end of it. And Jack, you know, and this was coming from a protective place. Jack was emotionally and psychologically distancing himself. So uh, away from this distressing stimulus that he wouldn't be um, quite in a, a state of uh, prolonged distress around it. So what I wanted to focus on within music therapy was have the music be a shared encounter where Frank and Jack can not only interact, but they could interact in a way in which there was a, um, a father-son dynamic that could be reestablished. So, so that when, so that before Frank passed away, Jack would have an opportunity to say goodbye to his father as his father. Um, I wanted to ensure that, and I also wanted to ensure that Frank wasn't going to be in a place of terminal agitation. Terminal agitation is this phenomenon that happens for some folks at the end of life when they're actively dying, um, active, uh, actively dying or imminent death. This is 24 to 72 hour window in which uh, symptoms uh, radically shift and we can project that the person will pass away by the end of that window. Um, and sometimes what happens at that point is the person becomes agitated. Very often they'll tear at their hospital gown, they'll try to get out of bed, they'll yell for help. And we don't really know why, definitively, why some people get terminal agitation and others don't. My personal theory is that these are the folks who have unfinished business at the end of life. I think it's why they're calling out for help. I think it's why they're trying to get out of bed. I think it's why they become so distressed as they realize that they've reached a point where they're not going to be able to fully resolve this unfinished business that's left on their table or left on their plate. And for a 52-year-old father, uh, I would imagine not being able to connect with your son at the end of life as you're actively dying would be a, a, a potential uh, source of distress. So for both parts, I wanted, for both of them, I wanted them to be able to connect through this father-son dynamic. So through the pictures uh, compilation, it, this was a family that originally was, was from Alabama, the state of Alabama in the States, and we were living in Delaware. And uh, an anthem for Alabamians is Sweet Home Alabama, this traditional Leonard Skinner song. And Frank was talked about how he loved when Jack would play it on guitar. And so week after week, I'd be going in and say, Jack, is this the week? Are you going to play it? Are we going to be able to record this and do this with your dad? And, he, and he'd always have like an excuse and a reason. And I, I didn't want to push. I knew if I pushed too hard, he would, he would back away from me as well. He would feel a pressure from me that would disrupt our therapeutic relationship. So I didn't press. And eventually we reached this place where uh, Frank was actively dying and Jack had asked that I come over. So his mom called me up and I, I put aside time, uh, my schedule for that evening. And I went over and I looked at Jack and I said, are we going to do this today? And he goes, yeah. So we went down into the basement and, I, and so we had a discussion. We, you know, Jack, how do you, how should we recreate um, Sweet Home Alabama? What do you, what do you want your role to be in this? And he said, I want to play guitar. I said, great. So do you want to sing and I'll bat and I'll, so you'll be the, the lead guitar and I'll be the, um, I'll be the rhythm guitar. And do you want to sing? And the singing was too much for him. Um, there's a whole, a whole lot of scholarship that talks about how singing is this externalization of our psyche of who we are. And it leaves us very vulnerable. And uh, Jack was not in any place at that point to be making himself that vulnerable coming out of this protracted two year process of saying goodbye to his father and now being in a place in which, uh, uh, within 24 to 72 hours, he was going to be forced into saying goodbye. So I said, um, so I asked him, do you want to keep this just guitar? We just play along with the riff or do you want me to sing? He wanted me to sing. Um, so I don't know if I have, am I able to share sound? Or it's possible maybe, I, uh, I'm not sure the, the best way to share this audio clip. Lisa, if you, if you unshare your screen and reshare it, but before you, before you, you click OK, choose um, something about um, share computer audio or use computer audio, it'll work then. Okay. Or, so unless it's on your, no, is it on your machine? It's on mine. Oh, yeah. okay. Well then if, if Lisa, you stop your share and Noah, you share your, your screen and then press use audio or I can't remember what it is. I'll tell you now exactly. Sorry. Yeah, sure. I think it should be share sound, share sound. Yeah. And that'll work. Okay. Are you hearing that? I heard it. You heard it. Great. Thank you. All right. So what you're going to hear is Jack playing guitar and you're going to be hearing me singing. And so uh, we'll, we'll go about like 30 seconds in and then I'll stop and I'll point some stuff out. <laughs> So 
So if you've ever heard Sweet Home Alabama before, it's this raucous song. It's very, um, it's celebratory. Uh, for people from the South, it's very much an anthem for them. Uh, for other folks, it's a bar song. This is when you've had a few too many and it comes on and you're, you get your arm around your buddy and you're singing it, uh, not, not like half singing, half shouting, but it's either way, it's lots of energy. It's very exuberant. But what we but we don't hear that version of it. We hear bum, 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 bum. And it's very, um, it's not that it's slower, but it's intense and it's heavy. And so it's easy to point to it and say, well, maybe this is just reflective of Jack's skill level and fair enough. That might be a context here that we need to be taking into consideration. I think the larger consideration here is what's happening on a psychological and emotional and an interpersonal level uh, for Jack. And he's having to say goodbye to his father. And so there's going to be an ugliness to that at this stage in the game. Um, a 15 year old should not have to say goodbye to his father this early and having and, and having to bear witness to him experiencing this sort of uh, progressive disease. So it, the music is reflecting what his psychological process is right now. The music is becoming a vehicle for him to um, emotionally discharge what's been he's been holding on to and he's been holding on to a lot up until this point and so there is a it's a very tightly controlled but nevertheless it's a catharsis that he is putting into the music and so my challenge then as the music therapist was to be considering how is my voice going to be reflecting this so I could have um, so it could have gone up a higher octave but I thought no I need this th this needs to be this is more uh, melancholy this is a little bit more this isn't uh, a celebratory um, this isn't raucous this isn't an anthem this is a lament almost and so my voice is going to start reflecting that to a certain extent <laughs> Uh, so just for time purposes, I'm going to stop that there. Um, and so what ended up happening is we recorded the, the, the song and what I, I you know, and I, I stayed for a little bit while longer, provided Jack support. And I left that night and Frank passed away overnight. And I came back the next morning and Jack was asleep. I was talking to his mom and she was saying that Jack had gone up um, upstairs and he played the song for his dad and he played it for him a couple of times and that at the end of the night, he was able to lie in bed next to like next to his dad and hold his hand at a certain point. So they were able to have this reconnection as father and son. And it helped them to move into, it helped Jack to, and I followed up with Jack for a couple of bereavement sessions afterwards. And having had that pre-bereavement process through music therapy, where they were able to re-engage with these pre-illness identities of father, son, and not just caregiver and care recipient, there was a, an ability to move into bereavement with a feeling of loss, but also a feeling of resolution and closure as well. Um, and so I'll just uh, end very quickly by um, there's a there's a final slide just about this idea of bearing witness and the importance of being present in these intense spaces. And that's one of the, the, the benefits of music therapy is that we're able to be present in these ways that feel safe and and, and, and feels inviting for uh, for clients or for patients who are in a place and that, that's ready to to engage in this type of work. So thank you. Thank you so much, Noah, and apologies, I have to turn my camera off because my internet <laughs> keeps dropping. Uh, so I'm going to um, turn over now to Dr. Katie Gillespie. Uh, he's going to tell you about our current research on music therapy for supporting informal cares of people at the end of their life. So Katie, I'll hand over to you now to talk us through the aims of the project and why this research is so important. Thanks, Tracy. Just saying that audio clip was very difficult to follow, starting to talk about our research project. Um, but I'll first talk about the aims of the study and outline why the topic is important and then give a demonstration of our new website. So the study aims to identify where more research is needed for supporting informal carers of people at end of life and to invite informal carers to join our carer advisory group. And Tracy will be talking more about that later. So um, it will be three phases and we are currently in phase one. 
So we're currently conducting a systematic literature review to search for all the existing international research on music therapy within formal carers of people at end of life to see what research questions still need to be answered. In phase two, we will hold a workshop with a diverse range of international stakeholders. Uh, and by stakeholders, we mean people who have had experience of bereavement, music therapists, and other healthcare professionals supporting carers to identify any other key questions that need to be answered. And this will help us develop a plan for research on music therapy with informal carers of people at end of life. In phase three, people who have experienced bereavement, individuals with lived experience of being a carer for a patient at end of life, music therapists and other professionals who support carers will work together to design a music therapy intervention that is adapted to the needs of carers of patients at end of life and that can be used as part of routine NHS care. So next slide, please. So all these phases of work will help us develop a funding application to test the feasibility of our co-designed music therapy intervention with the final aim of improving outcomes for informal carers of people at end of life. Uh, next slide, please. So why is this important? And first, who is an informal carer? So an informal carer is anyone who looks after a family member, partner or friend who needs help because of their illness, frailty or disability and cannot cope without their support. And as Noah mentioned, the care they provide is unpaid. Informal carers of people who are at end of life care for those who could be within the last year, weeks or days of life. And these informal carers often experience physical and emotional exhaustion and emotional distress, which can impact on their own mental and physical health and quality of life. Some carers may also experience complicated grief, which is associated with the prolonged impact on their psychological and social functioning and which can have a negative long-term effect on their mental well-being and their social relationships. So in order to avoid this, it is important that informal carers receive appropriate support. Ne next slide, please. So arts-based therapies, such as music therapy, can work on reducing risk factors, such as those that Lisa mentioned earlier, and those can include uh, pre-bereavement depression, anxiety, and family conflict at end of life. And music therapy is flexible in that it can be offered pre and post bereavement and can be used to support the patient and the carer, the whole immediate family or the carer only, depending on need. Next slide, please. So while we know that music therapy is highly valued by patients and carers, as Lisa was saying, there's very little research on the role of music therapy in improving outcomes for informal carers of people at end of life. Um, and as a result, we don't know if current music therapy services are producing the best outcomes possible for carers, and music therapy is rarely funded as a core service in the NHS. Next slide, please. So while there's not a lot of evidence available yet, music therapists working in this area is increasingly common in practice. So in a 2018 survey of 50 music therapists, a high proportion uh, reported work focused on the family member at end of life and their loved one, mostly for pre-bereavement support at the time of passing and at post-bereavement. So the music therapist reported that work with family members and loved ones could include individual and joint sessions with the patient, supporting children who are facing the loss of a parent, supporting parents and siblings facing the loss of a child, preparation for funerals, as well as memory making. So ne next slide, please. So I'll now talk for a bit about our study website, which is now live. I will take you through a quick demonstration of this with some images of the page, and we'll provide a link again in the slides at the end of the event. So first, the website contains an introduction to the team and the project. And again, I'll just go through the website very, very quickly. So next slide, please. So there are also photos and a short bio uh, for each member of the team, and you will have seen some of these photos already. And here are the photos of the rest of the team. So there's a short project summary, which provides information on the background of the project. Next slide, please. As well as the description of our aims and what we hope to achieve with the project. So there's a poster which gives an overview of the study and some additional information on each phase. Next. If you're interested in finding out more about music therapy, there is some information on the website, including a short video introduction from the British Association for Music Therapy. And finally, if you're interested in finding out more about previous research in this area, which has been done at Queen's, there's some information on previous studies and links to papers. 
So I'll now pass over to Tracy, who's going to speak about an opportunity for carers to be involved in the research. Thank you, Katie. So this is the final slide before our question and answer session, but also a very important aspect of our current project, and that is PPI involvement in our research. So this is Dr. Angela McCullough and Lorna, um, who are on our Carers Advisory Group um, and have been involved in this project from the very start and will continue to be involved in all of the phases going forward. But we also have an opportunity for a further 12 informal carers to work with us in the final phase of this project and that will involve helping us to design a music therapy intervention adapted to the needs of carers of patients at end of life and that can be used as part of routine care. So all you need is to have first-hand ex experience of caring for a close person at the end of their life. If that is you or you know someone you think might be interested please do get in touch with us in terms of what to expect, you will be invited to attend a three-hour online workshop in either March or May of next year, so 2022. And you will receive reimbursement for your time. And just to highlight that if you have cared for someone at the end of their life, you're the expert in terms of um, what support is needed. And as such, we'll be an invaluable member of the research team. We will provide a clear role description and any additional training or support that you may need. Um, we will provide that also. So please do get in touch if you think this is something that you'd be interested in. And I'll just hand over now to Audrey, who's going to facilitate the, the question and answer session. Thank you.